Welcome to our single day through Obadiah, uh, one chapter of course. And Obadiah chronologically is the very first of the prophets of the 16 books of the major and minor prophets of the Old Testament. And he wasn't actually prophesying against Israel or Judah. He was prophesying against one of their neighbors, their cousins, the Edomites. Uh, if you read through the histories of the Old Testament, you see the Edomites often attacked Israel whenever God was disciplining the nation of Israel or Judah. Uh, he would send nations against them to destroy them and carry off some of their people captive. And very often that um, those attackers included the Edomites. So who were the Edomites? These were the descendants of Esau. Okay, now this is important to understand. God's plan of redemption to save a chosen people for himself and give them to his son as a bride, which is what the church is. That whole plan started in space and time. Yes, okay, it started in the Garden of Eden with the promise of the seed of the woman that would come and crush the serpent's head. But in earnest, the big move began when God chose a man and appeared to him this man's name was Abraham. And he promised this man, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through your family, Abraham, the gospel is going to come to the world. This seed of the woman that I promised to Eve in the Garden of Eden, who would undo what Satan did when he caused the whole world to descend into sin, this seed this descendant will be born through you. Abraham believed that promise and he was justified by faith. Abraham then had a son named Isaac. Uh, Isaac was chosen as the son of promise. His brother Ishmael was rejected because he was not the son of promise. He was the son of the flesh. Abraham taking things and Sarah taking things into their own hands. To see the promise fulfilled. God rejected him. Eventually the miracle son was born. Isaac then has two sons. You remember their names? Jacob and Esau. And we see the whole story of Jacob and Esau unfold as Esau is jealous of Jacob and drives him from their home. Esau enjoys Growing up in the home of his parents, he enjoys the land. He's the one that for a time seems to have gained the victory over his brother Jacob after Jacob stole his blessing. And yet in the end, it is Jacob who returns with 12 sons of his own. And the promise is, is, is picked up in Jacob's line. So... That as a, as a theme, as a motif, the two sons, Jacob versus Esau, becomes the very picture God uses through scripture of how God operates. And if you're a Methodist, I apologize this morning. I'm going to contradict one of the things you taught in the Methodist church and in many other churches. One of the fundamental principles of God's dealings with the world is that God chooses certain people to be his own. Predestination is an emphatic truth of scripture. And when God chooses someone, he chooses them for no other reason than he set his love upon them. He does not choose them for anything in themselves. He doesn't look into the future and see that they will believe in him. And so then he chooses them for himself. No, God is sovereign. He simply has elected some to be his own. And then in space and time, as time unfolds, those people hear the call of the gospel and they are saved. Okay, so as a picture of predestination, Jacob versus Esau is the one of the major motifs that the scriptures use. We see Malachi pick this up again when the, the prophet Malachi is rebuking uh, the nation of Israel saying, 
God says, didn't I choose you? And yet you have disobeyed me. And uh, didn't I love you? And, and they say, well, how did you love us? And then he says, well, isn't it true that Jacob and Esau were twins? I mean, you can't have two people that are more alike. Come from the same family, born at the same time. They're in the same generation. They, there's nothing different between them. They are twins. And yet, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated. That, that was God's argument in the book of Malachi. Paul then picks that up in Romans chapter 9, which is the great teaching on predestination in Scripture, which you just simply cannot deny. And he picks this up again. This is how God works. Okay, now, if you follow what happens to those who are elect and those who are not elect, very often it is the case that those who are not elect, the reprobate, they are sinful. And they will be judged not because they are not elect, they will be judged because they are sinful. And yet they are not disciplined in this life. And the book of Hebrews makes that point. You are only disciplined by God if you're a child of God. And so if you're being disciplined, you need to rejoice in the discipline of God. It means you're his son. It means you're his daughter. And yet the wicked often seem to just prosper and enjoy their lives of sin. And there's no discipline for them. But the children of God seem to be buffeted on every side. And yet, in the end, it turns out that through the discipline, the, the children of God, the elect of God, are always restored and given far more than they ever deserve. And yet the reprobate, in the end, face the, the, the end of their sin, judgment and, and dissolution of the things they enjoyed. Okay, now this is why the book of Obadiah is in the Bible. Because this is God's prophecy against the nation of the Edomites, the children of Esau. This is the nation that he did not choose. And yet Israel is the nation he chose. And in this prophecy, God is predicting the end of, of those things. He is predicting how that whole dynamic is going to unfold. The Edomites, though they gloated when, is, when Israel or Judah were being attacked by their enemies and they themselves would go in and attack them and cut off captives and steal the wealth. and They gloated over their victory over their brother. Yet in the end, God was going to completely destroy the Edomites and he was going to restore the, the nation of Israel. So let's read that from verse 17. But on Mount Zion... There shall be deliverance. So this is after a whole prophecy about how Esau is going to be judged, how the Edomites will be destroyed. On, on Mount Zion, the, the, the mountain of Israel, there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. The doctrine of predestination, though it is a hard doctrine, and though it does raise many questions that we can't answer, it is given to us for our encouragement. Because here's the truth of the matter. Your salvation does not depend on you. Your safety in the end does not depend on you. The promises of heaven do not depend on you. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to figure it all out. And you don't have to be perfect in order to gain it. God is going to discipline you in this life, my friend. If you're a Christian, I'm talking to those who are Christians. And you know you're saved. Which, by the way, if you're saved, you do know you're saved. The Bible says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. I can tell you 100% I know that I am saved. In fact, that's, I'm going to digress, I keep digressing, but 
That's one of the reasons the baptism in the Spirit is so important for Christians, because the Bible calls it a sealing, a sealing of your faith. A seal is when something is, is made outwardly known. There is a sign on it that this belongs to someone else. It belongs to God. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a seal to your faith. Something you can't deny when it's happened to you. So, if you are saved, none of this depends on you. God has chosen you. God is going to take you to heaven one day. He is going to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. Not because of anything in you, but simply because He chose you before the foundation of the world. He loves you. You are the apple of His eye. And yes, you may suffer more than the wicked people and unbelievers around you in this life. It may be just like as we see the life of Jacob versus the life of Esau and the life of the Israelites versus the life of the Edomites. Yet the point of this prophecy is in the end, God's will of election will stand. Well, I don't know how you respond to that, but the right response is one of glory and of rejoicing and of gratitude toward God that he chose a wretch like you. Why did he do that? Why did he choose me? And yet he, he did. And, and his love for me does not depend on anything in me. He simply loves me. And he is roaring over me like a lion, protecting me, disciplining me, leading me on. And he can't wait to take me home and be with me for eternity. Because he loves me. That's all I can say. He just loves me. And if you're a Christian, you can say the same. So God bless you and I'll see you tomorrow.